Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the headlines this week, the largest ever mammal from the age of the dinosaurs has been discovered, a bizarre kind of prehistoric alien fish has been found, a new species of Jurassic pterosaur has been named, and much more. Starting off the news this week, a study published in the Astrophysical Journal Letters has asked the question which came first, supermassive black holes or galaxies? This study has used observation and data from the James Webb Space Telescope and has come to a conclusion that challenges much of the current beliefs about how our universe formed to the way we know it today. The study focused on what it refers to as high redshift galaxies, these being galaxies that are furthest away from us. As the light takes longer to reach us, the further away these galaxies are, these distant galaxies are also the oldest galaxies we can observe. This study has come to the conclusion that the supermassive black holes at the centre of galaxies, like Sagittarius A star, at the centre of our own Milky Way, actually coexisted and influenced each other's fates. They argue that these black holes accelerated the rate of star formation in the first galaxies in the universe, which they say helps explain why these galaxies so far back in time are so bright. One researcher described the effect the black holes have on nearby matter as acting like enormous particle accelerators. The team says this high speed outflow from the black holes isn't continuous and instead separates the formation of the early universe into two phases, with the second having these outflows slow down. Another story then that challenges what little we know about the beginning of everything and sheds more light into the physics that created the universe that the James Webb Space Telescope is able to unpick for us today. Moving on, at the beginning of January, we reported the fantastic news that a male calf had been born to the endangered southern resident orcas. Unfortunately, it's looking like this calf has died. There are three pods in this population of orcas, J, K and L. The calf was born into J-Pod and was called J-60. Initially, it was believed that J-40 was its mother, but later it was thought that J-45 was the calf's mum. Whichever female it was, it would have been the first time they had had a calf. The pod was spotted last week in the San Juan Channel, socialising and travelling, and it was here that the Centre for Whale Research were able to conduct a photo ID survey of J-Pod, and it became evident that J-60 was missing. The protocol is that there must be three full censuses of the group to confirm mortality. This is because adult whales sometimes travel a significant distance from other whales for extended periods. However, a one month old would not be expected to be on its own for the length of time that the group was observed. There are only 73 of these beautiful creatures left, so every calf born is precious. But the survivorship of calves is low, with an estimate of about half of the calves born to the southern residents not surviving until adulthood. The mortality rate is particularly high for those calves born to first-time mothers, with particularly high levels of toxins, such as PCBs which have accumulated in the female's body, being transferred to the calf during gestation and lactation. A problem for all mothers, and indeed all of this population of orcas, is a lack of food. They are starving and desperately need more Chinook salmon, and for that to happen the dams preventing the Chinook from reaching their spawning grounds need to be breached. Without this, the future of the population of orcas is uncertain. First up in the paleontology news for this week is the revised description of a very bizarre kind of early vertebrate. Originally named in 1957, it was called Alien Acanthus Malkowski, and it's a species of placoderm, a group of armoured fishes that represent the earliest vertebrates with jaws. The fossils known for this species had previously been uncovered in Poland, in late Devonian aged rocks that are around 365 million years old. And in this new study, they report more specimens of the armoured fish from similar aged rocks in Morocco. Well-preserved skull of these fish were previously unknown, but this new Moroccan material reveals they had incredibly bizarre looking jaws, with a lower jaw that was significantly elongated and was actually twice the length of the skull. This sort of anatomy is now the oldest example of extreme jaw elongation among vertebrates, and indicates an interesting mode of feeding, in addition to some incredible convergent evolution with a modern group of fish, the half-beaks, which also have longer lower jaws than upper jaws. Alien acanthus translates to alien spine and was named as such in the 50s because they were thought to have very strange looking spines in their fins. However, thanks to this better preserved material, we now know these spines were actually the lower jaws. Along these jaws are sharp, 
backwards curving teeth that extend forwards to a point slightly in front of where the upper jaw ends. And based on the anatomy of the dentition, it seems they were well suited to capture live prey, such as other fishes. They also propose that the lower jaw extension may have functioned to strike prey and confuse them, as in modern sawfish, and the teeth that extended past the upper jaw may have been used to strike at soft-bodied prey. This new material is therefore a truly incredible discovery showing how diverse these early jawed vertebrates were, as well as expanding their known range of ecologies. Up next in the recent paleo news, a new genus and species of stegosaur has also been named. Called Yanbeilong ultimus, it's known from a partial skeleton including several vertebrae and parts of the pelvic girdle, and was found in early Cretaceous Age rocks in China. As the paper explains, stegosaurs are very rare and poorly represented in the Cretaceous, being most famous for living during the preceding Jurassic period, but we do know that they survived on until the end of the early Cretaceous, and potentially until the late Cretaceous, though this is less certain. Yambilong, coming from towards the end of the early Cretaceous, therefore potentially represents one of the last stegosaurs, hence its species name Ultimus, which is a really good species name, hinting that it might be the last of its lineage. The fossil material of Yan Beilong preserves various features indicating that it's a unique species, and also shows that it's closely related to the iconic late Jurassic North American species Stegosaurus stenops. It's also found to be a close relative of Werhosaurus homheni from the early Cretaceous of China and Mongolia, which has also been argued to be another species of Stegosaurus itself. So, an interesting new stegosaur species that provides paleontologists with a better idea of how these iconic dinosaurs evolved. This week has also seen the very exciting naming and description of the largest Mesozoic mammal found so far. This absolute unit has been named Patagomaya chanko, and comes from the very latest Cretaceous aged rocks in southern Patagonia. I love that you put absolute unit in there. That's the There's no other way to say it, really. Parts of the forelimb, hindlimb, and pelvic girdle were unearthed, and very clearly show that this was a huge mammal for the Mesozoic era, at a body mass of around 14 kilograms, beating the previous Mesozoic mammal heavyweight champion, a mammal from China called Rapina mammus, that got to a maximum of about 10 kilograms. Patagomea, meaning Patagonia mother, was uncovered from rocks of the Trillo Formation, which is the same formation that the recently named Mype Macrothorax was found in, meaning Patagomaya would have coexisted with giant Megaraptoran dinosaurs. Analyzing the evolutionary relationships of this mammal, the paleontologist found that it's actually a therian mammal. The large grouping of derived mammals, including us placentals, as well as the marsupials and various extinct relatives. This shows that the therian mammals of the ancient southern landmass Gondwana got to large sizes before their relatives on the northern landmasses of Laurasia, which seem to have stayed relatively small until after the extinction of the non bird dinosaurs. Plus, it also adds to the growing evidence suggesting that Gondwana, and the southern hemisphere in general, was a cradle for the evolution of modern mammal groups in addition to various extinct lineages. So, Patagomaya is an absolutely fantastic discovery that contributes to our improved understanding of mammal evolution, again showing that mammals were not all tiny, shrew-like things during the age of dinosaurs, and some managed to get pretty big. Also in the news for this week, a very nice summary of recent research into the evolution, diversity and extinction of the pterosaurs has been published. This review goes into the history of pterosaur discoveries and the science done on these flying reptiles, as well as outlining the major evolutionary developments that occurred, such as the evolution of toothlessness and giant wingspans during the Cretaceous period. Toothlessnessnessness. It also details recent developments concerning the extinction of pterosaurs, explaining how recent discoveries have shown pterosaur taxonomic diversity to have remained fairly high until the very end of the age of the dinosaurs, though their morphological diversity decreased. Competition with birds is also no longer thought to have been a major driving force behind their extinction, and is also discussed, so a really nice review of recent pterosaur science for anyone interested in these magnificent flying reptiles. Speaking of which, a new genus and species of pterosaur has also been named this week as well. It's a good week for pterosaurs. Coming from Middle Jurassic Age rocks on the Isle of Skye in Scotland, it's been named Chiotera evansae, with the genus name coming from the Scottish Gaelic word keo, meaning mist, and evans. 
after myself, obviously. Mm -hmm. Pterosaurs from the mid-Jurassic are relatively poorly unknown, despite this having been a significant time in their evolution, and so Chioterra is a very welcome discovery that adds some much needed data. The new species is known from three-dimensionally preserved partial skeleton in three blocks of rock, and includes vertebrae, parts of the pectoral and pelvic girdles, plus bones from the wings and hind limbs. The whole skeleton was micro CT scanned to reveal all of the anatomical details of the embedded bones, since some of the skeleton was still encased in very hard matrix. Looking at the evolutionary relationships of Chioterra, it adds support to the existence of a controversial grouping of pterosaurs called Darwinoptera, which appear to be a sister group to the more derived pterodactyloids that dominated the late Jurassic and Cretaceous. So a very significant pterosaur find that adds a great deal to our understanding of pterosaur evolution. And finally for the news this week, a series of studies have been published in the journals Nature and Nature, Ecology and Evolution, analysing a site in Germany that reveals some very interesting new data on the arrival of Homo sapiens in Europe. This locality, a place called Islenhol, near the town of Rhenus, preserves many stone technologies and bones from hominids that once lived here, and these new studies have revealed that the bones came from Homo sapiens, not the Neanderthals which were already in the region, and that the remains dated to around 45,000 years ago. This is significant as it shows that Homo sapiens were present in Central and Northwestern Europe long before the last Neanderthals went extinct in Southwestern Europe indicating the presence of a patchwork of distinct human populations and technological complexes across Europe during this time of transition between the Middle and Upper Paleolithic. This region would have also been quite cold at this time, as indicated by the isotope data and the types of animal bones found here, showing that these Homo sapien populations were making a living in pretty harsh conditions and were remarkably adaptable. Cut and burnt bones indicate that these people had a diet based on large terrestrial mammals such as horses, deer, rhinoceros, and sometimes carnivores. These people likely came to the region many times over the thousands of years it was used, in small groups of pioneers who only stayed for short periods of time, as indicated by the fluctuating human presence recorded in the sediments. So some really fascinating analyses of how these ancient humans were using these areas and braving the cold all those thousands of years ago. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. Um, I have to say an apology to the Germans for me butchering their town names, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>Coming from middle Jurassic Age rocks on the Isle of Skye in Scotland, it's been named Kyoterra Evanze. Is it not Ev Evanze? Evanze. <laughs> <laughs> Do you not say it? <laughs> I swear I, I think speak. It's, yeah, I'm pretty sure. It's definitely Evanze. Yeah, Evans A. Evans. Susan E. Evans. So Evans A. Susan E. Evans? Yeah. My name is Amelia Susan Evans, Wait, as it... in E. S. Evans, what? yeah. Wait, That's really Evans? weird. Alright, let's see. It's her middle name, Amelia. Elizabeth. Oh, that's close. That's a bit creepy, though. <laughs> that's kind of cool. This locality, a place called Islenhol, I'm really sorry, Germany, near the town of Rannis. <laughs> Rainus? Okay. Preserves. 